you have to have visionaries. You know, you have to have people that will think outside of the norm. We're getting access to, to viewpoints and to people and to connection that we never, ever would have. Having integrity in yourself and in your work, that is success. You have to believe change is possible. We are our own leaders and that we all are responsible for the change that we want to see. Part of what we have to do is think, how do we intentionally rebuild a sense of community? A broader question of representation, who gets to create the images to travel the world and define how we see the world. Every single person around the world can create a movement. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm Evan Smith. I'm a contributor at The Atlantic. I'm a senior advisor at Emerson Collective. I want to welcome you to the 2023 Atlantic Festival and to this amazing session, The Big Story, The Future of Conservatism. The spectrum of the political right is broad. Social conservatives, libertarians, MAGA supporters, populists, and rhinos, among others. And the issues prioritized by each group vary largely. Bringing together Atlantic journalists who cover conservative politics, today we'll explore the evolution of our political parties and the future of American conservatism and examine the animating forces galvanizing conservative voters in 2024. A bit of housekeeping, inevitably, before we begin. Please silence your cell phones, but keep them handy. If you see something or hear something today that captures your attention, we encourage you to share it with your social networks and please use the hashtag TAF23. Now join me in welcoming Atlantic staff writers David Frum and Helen Lewis. Here to lead the conversation is Atlantic senior editor Becca Rosen. Enjoy it. Thank you. Thank you. Good. Thank you. Thank you, Becca. Great. Okay, good. I'll get it from you at the end. Good to be up here today. Uh, with two of my favorite Atlantic writers, incisive political commentators, talking about one of my favorite topics and one of the most crucial topics, I think, for the future of the country, which is the future of American conservatism. Uh, there's obviously far more than we'll get to in the this course of this session. Uh, we will have time for Q&A at the end, so if you have questions, you can hold on to them, uh, and we'll get started. I'm going to start with um, last night's GOP primary debate. Um, what do you both, what do you see in that? What is, <laughs> and in the primary more generally right now, what is it telling us about the status of the Republican Party, whether there's a future for conservatism in it, and uh, where are we going? Well, I had the great fortune of being out last night, so I did the classic thing of catching up through the kind of accumulated wisdom of everyone else who had had to watch the, the debate. Way. Right, which is, it, it, which is very different. Like something I've learned from covering politics is, the experience of seeing what the kind of herd think about it is very different sometimes from experiencing it in, in the moment. And it can be quite good to watch these things without everyone else's opinions intruding. That said, when I read John Hendrickson, our brilliant politics writer's write-up, I thought, I'm okay to skip this one because it didn't change anything. The yeah. facts are, as far as I see it, still what they were. Donald Trump is, you know, double digits ahead. This is a contest of the also rounds. You know, are they running for VP? Are they running to be secretary of something? Are they running just to have a show on Fox News at the end of this? Yeah. Right. Uh, and you know, it's it's very difficult this stage of uh, political coverage because not a lot changes, but there's a lot of air time to fill. And so I did think, looking at that stage, it was yeah, it was the kind of rumble of the also rounds. Yeah, that's right. Um, the presidency of the United States is an awesome job. You get the big house, you get the big plane, you get the cars, you get the place in history. Most people who seek it, of course, don't, don't make it. So if you're going to do it, you need to understand, you need to be a big person. You need to take some risks. You need to reach for the job you want. And I was just struck by how little they all are. I mean, if you, can't, if, you, if, you, if you can't go up against Goliath, and if you're scared to face him, you shouldn't be on the field. Right. Stay home. There are lots of other things to do with your one and only life. Um, and and I, just, I just wonder, um, what I just... I mean, Chris Christie is at least willing to say, you know what, I'm, I'm, I'm here for a reason. I know why I'm here. The rest of them, that, that would be the question I would ask is, why are you here? And if you don't have the courage to face this challenge, 
Why would you seek a job where you have to go face all the hardest challenges in the world put together? You won't have the courage for them either. Yeah, I think and my question there is just what we see in Chris Christie, and I think he is presenting the most anti-Trump. Uh, he's attempting to find whatever anti-Trump lane there is in the Republican Party, but it's not there. I mean, who, wh who's his audience? Where His campaign has next to no chance of going anywhere. What hope is there? When I look at that debate stage, I think of it like you're looking through a prism, right? You're splitting the light. Everybody looks at Donald Trump's and thinks, well, what was the one thing that made this work, this very unlikely candidacy? And so you see different, splitting out different bits of it. So in Vivek Ramaswamy, you see, what if I just went on every podcast and talked about everything until the end of time ever, and I was very entertaining? <laughs> so he's got that section of Trumpism. Ron DeSantis, who I wrote a magazine profile um, of last year, you know, he's tried to, like, I can give you Donald Trump without the chaos. And then I said, you know, actually, he's given you Donald Trump without the jokes. Yeah. <laughs> And he tried out basically, like, you know, what, would it, what if I gave the Republican voters, you know, everything that they say they want in policy terms, but without Donald Trump? And it turned out that bet was precisely wrong. Um, you know, and then you have Nikki Haley who's trying to run as a kind of, you know, more of an establishment conservative. As you say, Chris Christie trying to do something no one else is doing. Everyone else on that stage is basically saying, you can't have Donald Trump, but he's amazing, isn't he? He's great. <laughs> but you definitely should have me, not him, which is just a fundamentally weird premise to operate a presidential campaign under. You know, when you ask the question, this is a, this phrase about finding the lane is a staple of our political commentary. Um, if you are looking for the lane, you're following someone else's yeah. lead. Um, what the great ones do <coughs> is they pave they make a lane. A lane. Yeah. Um, and to his credit, uh, I don't have a, Donald Trump did that. Do Donald Trump understood uh, in 2015 uh, what what this party is and what this party says it is have diverged so widely uh, that uh, there is some, uh, an opportunity here for something new. And one of the reasons that people kept losing to him in 2015 and that they're losing and why Ron DeSantis is losing to him now is uh, back in 2015, Ted Cruz and Marco Rubio and the others thought that what the Republicans had historically said about themselves was the truth and not what they were. And what Ron DeSantis is saying is, is rerunning a 2015 losing campaign by saying, let me believe all the things that people say, and let, let me not look at what, what they do. Um, and so that's going to be the, the next, the, it looks like Donald Trump will be the nominee. Um, he will probably lose. Should he win, we will be into a protracted series of constitutional crises, unlike anything we've seen since probably Reconstruction. Um, but if he should lose, the more probable outcome, we're going to be in a, a whole new era of American politics. Because at that point, at some point, Republicans have to notice um, they've lost every election except for the fluke 2016 Electoral College outcome. They lost in 2018, they lost the House. In 2020, they lost the presidency. Uh, in 2021, they lost the Senate. In 2022, they had the worst outcome for the out party since the Great Depression. Um, you know, we're all conscious the Republicans picked up seats in the House of Representatives, but they lost a Senate seat, they lost two governorships, and they lost four state houses. And the, the uh, something that the out party has not done since the 1930s. Um, so if you look, and the farther you go down the ballot, the better the Democrats did. And uh, the, look, Trump's genius is that he can take the worst stake in the world and say it's a great stake. And people are so unused to that level of lying. I think, well, maybe it's not the best stake in the world, but top three, top six. The idea, no, it's actually literally the worst stake in the world. So the idea that there's been this enormous losing run, that people will see that if we do not stop along the way for the worst constitutional crises since, the, since Reconstruction. Yeah, let's dig into those two different scenarios a little more, and I'm more agnostic than you are on what the outcomes could be right now. Say he does win. What, is the, what, what happens to the Republican Party then? What happens to the conservative ideals, what happens to the country? I mean, I think him winning would be the worst possible thing that could happen to the Republican Party as a future governing vehicle in the long term. Because as we were discussing, Donald Trump is this incredibly weird alchemy of lots of things that kind of shouldn't work all melded together in this very attractive telegenic package. And the lesson that the party will take is, that's fine, we don't need to change anything. You know, we just had some bad cycles. And, you know, this is 
affected by me coming from Britain, where I've watched the Labour Party, which I covered for a long time, the left-wing party, go through what I think of as a kind of stages of grief about why, why do we keep losing? And there's a kind of denial, bargaining, and then finally acceptance that you're not in the same place as where the voters are. And I think that the best thing that could possibly happen for the future of American conservatism would be for Donald Trump to lose fairly, because then the party would be forced to go away and think, what do we want to actually be that represents the big number of conservatives there are in this country? Like, what, what can that look like in the future? Rather than, well, we'll just keep putting up the biggest bully in the playground. You know, that's... So you're hopeful in either case? <laughs> I'm not hopeful. No, I'm really not hopeful. Really, I'm really not hopeful. <laughs> no one is more hopeful that uh, Trump loses than David because you wrote a story of the headline of which was the coming Biden blowout, right? right? So, like, anything yeah, less David's than a, <laughs> than a yeah. kind of wipeout for, for... Well, Biden. I think it's going to be down the ballot because I think of the power of the abortion issue. Mm -hmm. but it should Trump, I don't think there's any way he wins the, the popular vote, but the Electoral College might conceivably help him. Yeah. If, if that happens, here's, here's where we are. So Trump may very possibly be literally in prison on Election Day. Um, no, it's, it's, really, it's really quite, I, I don't say that in a kind of like go team, but just it's a real possibility because he's, he, he, there are enough trials. Right. He, every time he's in front of a judge and jury, he loses. Um, and he lost just again with the death sentence applied to his corporation, massive fraud. Um, so he may be in prison. If not, he will be deep into the criminal process. So his first action as president has to be to shut that down and then to shut down not only um, the uh, federal processes, but the, the state processes. All of these are questions that have never been raised before. Um, and he will then say to his party, you have to, um, you have to agree with me that the president has the power to shut down an investigation of the president, and the president has the power to shut down state investigations of the president. And I think one of the things that has been a real characteristic of the summer we've just passed is a lot of people believe in the power of magic words. I mean, on the Democratic side, you see that with this this uh, idea that you can invoke the 14th Amendment and then Trump goes away. There are no Harry Potter cheat codes here. Uh, po politics is about the clash of masses of millions and tens of millions of people against each other through some kind of peaceful, we hope, mostly, um, process of arbitration. So Trump's going to try these claims of complete immunity to criminal prosecution, state and federal, and he will force his party to back him. And the other side, which is the larger side and the more affluent side, uh, will say, that's nonsense. None of that is true. Uh, the president can't do these things. The last head of government, the last head of state in the English-speaking world who tried this was James II, and the English ran him out of town. <laughs> and the one who tried it before that was Charles I, and the English took off his head. So the, 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 there's a pretty strong tradition in the English-speaking right. world that the law applies to the head of yeah. government. Yeah. Um, and if this head of government, the head of state, says, no, not me, yeah. that's a crisis. And, and then just to spice things up. And at that point, he also turns off the flow of arms to Ukraine and hands the biggest geopolitical defeat to the United States since, since who knows when. Right, I mean, this is just what we have and what we're dealing with is this complete absence of normal politics in any sense. I mean, there's, it just, I keep talking about this with my writers, but there's so many opportunities right now for complete chaos in our system and for things to just go completely haywire. And it just seems like to bank on a normal election right now is just very, challenging leap of faith. Right. I don't want to come in as a European and go, have you thought about having a prime ministerial system? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> have you thought about parliament? Yeah. I don't want to, it's really quite good. When they turn out to be terrible, their own party gets rid of them. <laughs> but yeah. But, Unfortunately, no, I think, challenging for us. But yeah, yeah, okay, maybe a yeah. bit late for that now. But yeah, I think that's exactly the point, is that there are so many bits of the American political system you would not design like this while you're starting it from scratch, like the... The minority rule aspect of it, the Supreme Court, the electoral like, college, like David was saying, college, exactly. Yeah. All of these things that combine to make it this kind of like a. It's like a, one of those houses where every wall doesn't quite work, but it all leans on each other, right? And it only just you know, like it's holding up that way. And then only one thing needs to tip a bit for. And I think. And the other thing I think is we have this really deep sense of complacency. Um, I certainly felt this in Britain before Brexit. I think I felt it here before the election of Trump. There was a feeling that how bad can things really get? Uh, like, you know, we're, we're obviously, we're never going to have a revolution. We're never going to have a civil war. Those, those are things that used to happen in the past. Passe, yeah. And it was really difficult to try and write in that, without being hysterical mm -hmm. and overwrought mm -hmm. and, and kind of, you know, throwing ourselves to the ground weeping, but just saying, no, this is something that happens in many countries around the world. Why do you think that America is specially exempt from, right. from these kind of huge violent political forces? Yeah. One of the best things that has happened to the world is the rise of liberal democracy, where people settle their arguments with politics, not killing each other. Right. 
and well, they're real risk. Fragile, yeah. right. And right. I think that the, what is really fascinating to me is when you look at revolutions, traditionally they are carried out either by young people or by very poor countries. So what we see in America is very different, which is older, affluent voters. They are the ones who are most agitating for political violence. They're the ones who are deepest in conspiracist networks. And that is something that the world hasn't really seen interesting. before. You know, I went to the villages in the course of um, reporting my Ron DeSantis piece, which is the retirement home in Florida. So, yeah, tell people what it is if they don't know. It is a huge, sprawling retirement community, 100,000 people outside Orlando. And, you know, it was full of militant seniors. There is no other way to say that. <laughs> Which, I mean, it sounds funny, but it actually it, it sounds funny, but these people are very heavily armed. Might not be that funny, yeah. <laughs> and they think that the apocalypse is coming, yeah. uh, and and that's the bit that I, I don't know about you, David. I find it difficult to calibrate my yeah. panic level. About yeah, that, right. Now that's a, that's a very astute observation, and it's it's um, it makes me think just as you say this. Um, so one of the reasons the year 1968 was so destabilizing was we saw something that we had never seen before, which is this vast generational mass that was neither ch child nor adult, and that had lots of money, right? more money than that. They didn't have to go to work immediately. And so this invention of the thing called the teenager and, this, and the arrival of teenagers on an unprecedented scale um, with no immediate need to go to work, that was a new thing. And they behaved in a very adolescent way <laughs> all across the planet. Maybe some of the people here were there. <laughs> <laughs> Many so of the integrators. Okay, so <laughs> now, now we're seeing something that has truly never been seen before in enormous numbers of very healthy, very affluent people in their middle and late 60s. That's a new thing. It's the uh, same people. And it's the same people. <laughs> <laughs> and, and they haven't improved. <laughs> but if we're, if we're going to talk about the future a little bit. I, I want to put in a small commercial because I remain a registered Republican. I, I, although most of my friends would not say this of me, I still do think of myself as a, as a conservative and a conservative person. That I, I, in, in my opinion, the, the structure of forwardness and backwardness, conservatism, is hardwired into the human brain. Um, that you're just born that way. Um, and, a, and a statistically predictable number of people will be born each way. And, and in the divine scheme, which I also believe in, that that's for a reason, that that's how societies balance themselves. That, um, you know, mm. uh, you look at the menu, should we try something new or should we have the thing we always like? Um, and both that's a good conversation to have. Should we try something new or have the thing we always liked? And uh, James Carville once said that every election is a referendum on the question, more of the same or something new. And those are important questions. Um, and they need to be argued out. And they're things that can be, that need to be reintroduced. And one, one of the, one of the um, prices of the Trump years is because you have someone who, is in, who leads the conservative coalition, or what would have been called the conservative coalition, who has no interest in any idea and is only interested in protecting himself from the legal consequences of his actions. There are a lot of things that are not being discussed. And um, you know, who talks about the, the debt anymore? Who talks about public finances anymore? Uh, who in Washington stands up for free international trade? Um, who, uh, who is giving a generous, not mean-spirited um, and denigrated, but a generous defense of the American past in the face of ever-rising numbers of people who want to um, uh, change it? I mean, we had this episode three summers ago where all kinds of monuments were knocked down in a way that hasn't been seen since the United States went around uh, uh, taking uh, German words off things in 1917 and 1918. And why did no one, wh why was there no intelligent conversation about that? Well, because it was Donald, it was the people who were demanding total change of the American past versus Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. And that became a very easy debate for most people to find a side on. And it should have been harder. Mm -hmm. Let's, let's, let's take this conversation and look back a little more into the more recent past, but, um, I was just, I've been thinking a lot about our colleague McKay Coppins' uh, mm. piece about Romney, and I actually have a little bit um, that he wrote that I think is a really, this is just a passage that's. This is a bit about the salmon fillets, because that was. <laughs> I, I, was, I blocked I was that part disgusting. out. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
But you have this character, this figure, who went from the Republican standard bearer, as, as McKay puts it, to a pariah in the party. And uh, McKay writes, was the authoritarian element of the GOP a product of President Trump, or had it always been there, just waiting to be activated by a sufficiently shameless de demagogue? And what role had the members of the mainstream establishment, people like him, the reasonable Republicans, played in allowing the rot on the right to fester? I'm curious for your, both of your takes on this. Well, I think that there is no one I have more contempt for than the people who don't believe this but have decided to go along with it anyway. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that is, a, I would say that if they were on the left just as much as on the right, there are huge parts of the party who have decided that they'd rather stay being a senator than stand up for anything that they believe in. There are people, we know this from the Dominion lawsuit at Fox News, who think that their own viewers are loons. And they disrespect them far more than you know any kind of left-wing, rootless cosmopolitan like me would do. <laughs> they, they think that their viewers are scum, but they think that they're selling stuff to them and they keep buying it, so they carry on. And that, those are the people, I think, that history will judge most harshly. The way that I see Donald Trump, this may help to make sense of him, is basically he's like a cat. If you have a cat, the cat doesn't really love you. The cat loves your tin opener, right? The cat just loves the fact that you feed it. The cat will eat the turkey that is left out on the side. And you kind of can't blame that on the cat because that is, it knows no other way of being. The problem is if so you have somebody who lets their cat run riot. And I think that's how it, it, those are the people I think are probably most interesting to write about. I don't know what you feel about this, David, but writing about Trump is a kind of dead end because he is what he is. The people, it's interesting to write about are the people who enable him. Mm -hmm. um, and those that's are the, where the moral. Right, those are the yeah. more complicated stories for me. Yeah. Um, no, there is. Uh, there's an old saying in Tammany Hall that it is, it's better to lose an election than lose control of the party. And so, so the history of American politics has been many, many cases where parties, for one reason or another, had a standard bearer, especially this happens a lot at the state level, but it's also happened at the federal level, where the party decides this person is unacceptable, too dangerous. And either they get rid of that person altogether, or if they can't, they don't help them very much. And then that person loses, and uh, the party reasserts itself, cleans itself. They're going... There are going to be a lot of elections. There are going, it's, it's not such a, a, a big deal to lose one. You win the, you know, uh, win the next one. One of the things that I think has been a real resource to Donald Trump has been an, an, a rise of an apocalyptic mentality on the conservative mm -hmm. world, where mm -hmm. if we don't beat Hillary Clinton in 2016, it's the end of American civilization. And, and therefore, any, there's no price too, pay, too high to pay. And I, I think what I would invite but I sometimes make this point to my Republican friends. Imagine that Hillary Clinton had eked it out in 2016. Things had broken a little bit differently, and with, with her 48% of the vote, she'd become president, facing, you'll recall, a Republican House and Senate. What exactly would she have done that you wouldn't have liked with a Republican House and Senate and 48% of the vote? And then, what would the 2018 election have looked like? She'd have been hammered. The Democrats would have been, yeah. there would have been a Republican sweep across the country. And then in 2020, the board would have been cleared. You'd have won the presidency with a big major, majority too big to lose in 2022. You could do what you want. It, it's, it, no one election is worth this. Um, and you would not have had the odium, and you would not have had the discredit, and then all of you could have said, I was never for that guy. What a loser. Um, and uh, I have no sympathy for him as he's dealing with the state of New York as they go through his books, which he unwisely exposed to public view. Um, so yeah, it's that apocalyptic sensibility that has been, uh, and I think that's a new thing. I don't think the political professionals of two generations ago right. thought that way. Yeah, it's apocalyptic, and it's also representative of very little faith in the American system, really, yeah. it, to self-correct and to to move forward. That is the saddest thing about it. And yeah. I think you're right. I think it is a post 1990s thing. It is a feeling, actually, it ironically, does think that the end of history happened. That was as good as things were ever going to be, and it's downhill yeah. from here, and it's about scrapping with other people for the dwindling resources that we have. And that's, that is really, actually, it's a fundamentally tragic worldview. Right. We're going to open it up to the audience questions. There will be mics coming around, so raise your hands, and um, let's go to this gentleman on the aisle right up here. Can we, oh, sorry, I'll go back there next. No. Okay. Um, so my question is for everybody, but... I think more specifically, David, because you were saying that you believe a Trump victory would be apocalyptic for, semi-apocalyptic for the Constitution, and you said it caused a constitutional crisis. So when I think conservatism, I think of the Constitution and the ideas and the values that go along with it. And I think we can generally agree that the Republican Party uh, is, generally speaking, the conservative party of the United States. So 
My question is, why do you think the party who tries to uphold the U.S. Constitution would ever attempt to go against it, regardless of who's president? Uh, because because the parties, have, parties are much weaker than they used to be. There's a collective action problem. So you can invoke the Republican Party, but every person who has decision-making power is thinking about me and my career. Uh, and, and uh, you know, what is that line from uh, Shrek where uh, the uh, Lord Farquhar says, some of you may die, but our cause will live on? <laughs> And, and they say, wait, wait a minute, that's, that's me you're talking to. And, and, and look, they won't leave the Senate for any reason. Like, they're 90 years old, and they have 48 grandchildren, you great grandchildren. You, you think they'd have something to do, they don't leave. Um, but here's, here's the nature of the crisis. Let me be explicit about this. Donald Trump's claim is going to be that the president is exempt from federal criminal process. If that's true, uh, the president can murder the first lady in the White House, and there's nothing anybody can do about it. Maybe you can impeach and remove him, but the president can write the pardon first, then murder the first lady. Uh, then, yes, the president is impeached and removed, but there are no criminal penalties as a result of it. So he loses his job, but it might be worth it. Um, and the president can counterfeit. The, the Constitution gives the federal government authority over counterfeiting and piracy on the high seas. The president could counterfeit money in the basement of the White House. I mean, it just can't be true that the president can do these things. But that's going to be the position that one of the two great parties is going to have to maintain. And by the way, that the president is exempt from state process. Now, that means that if any president goes home for the weekend, gets hammered, and gets in the car and drives over a pedestrian, the president can't be held for, none of that can be true. Uh, but that's going to be the position that people are going to have to take. And if it's true, it just dissolves the whole structure of law. Up here for the gentleman on the aisle, please. Thank you. David, um, I know you wrote that coming Biden blowout piece a couple months ago, but uh, you're like the only commentator on the scene <laughs> who is Biden optimistic yeah. at this stage. Um, so, and I know that there are lots of people um, in the audience throughout the country, et cetera, who are very anxious about President Biden's prospects in the 2024 election, given the existential stakes um, if the Republicans take back the White House with Donald Trump as their standard bearer. So please give us some hope about uh, well, why do I think the prospects gonna, of President oh, Biden. Thank you. Well, I think it's gonna win. So uh, there's no recession. People expected a recession. Many people expected that there would be a recession right now. There's no recession. The economy is not everything that people might hope for. Um, but if you want a job, you get one. If, um, and by the way, if you want two, you can have two. Because um, <laughs> there's lots. Um, and I, I, I think, to me, the real revelation of 22, and I, I had, in advance of 22, I said, I think the abortion issue will be important in 24. But it's, it's not going to have bitten people. It's going to be very abstract in 22. And do people react to abstract threats? Answer. Yes. Yes, they do. At least one that is so intimate. And by 24, I think the threat will be, it is now already, we do have women in prison for buying their daughter's abortion pills. Um, there's one in Nebraska right now. Um, and, and so I, I think that the um, mobilization of American women is going to be a very powerful thing. And I think the lesson of 22 was everyone underestimated that. The last thing is, I think uh, when you read the polls, as, someone, as a big consumer of polls, it's really important to remember that the question people hear is not necessarily the question that the pollster thought the pollster asked or the reader of the poll thinks. Um, and uh, a, st a story I often, uh, if, if you, those of you who will remember the 92 election, remember the third debate between Bush, Perot, and Clinton, the town hall moderated by Carol Simpson. And Carol Simpson at one point uh, called on a woman, quite elderly woman, quite frail and obviously scared out of her mind and being on TV for the one and only time in her life. And she asked the candidates, I would like to ask each of you how you personally have been affected by the deficit. Okay, nervous moment. Uh, deficit's pretty abstract. Bush goes first, misses, Perot goes second, says something crazy. And Clinton says, I will answer that question, but first you tell me how have you been affected by the deficit? And then it turned out, whether because she was nervous or had never known the answer, difference in the first place, she meant the recession. She mixed them up. Maybe uh, uh, she was, politics was not her language. And so I think when you look at these polls and people say, what do you think of Biden? I don't know, he's pretty old. How would you like to have uh, your intimate life uh, surveilled and policed by the state? No. <laughs> One more question. Uh, yes, Ms. Lewis. 
So um, <laughs> you wrote about in the UK why so many conservatives feel like losers. Mm. But I feel like that's really applicable in the US too. You know, they keep writing this court, winning win after win after win. How do you think that shapes the conservative party in the US? Well, one of the things I think is most interesting, we've talked about conservatism very broadly here. So you're right that social conservatism is one thing, libertarianism is another thing, economic conservatism is another thing. And then we get to the point of authoritarianism. And David's exactly right about the fact that there are different personality types. And one of the most interesting people I've interviewed recently is a political scientist called Karen Stenner. She researches something she calls the authoritarian disposition. She reckons about a fifth of people have it. And these people prize very highly oneness and sameness. And she said in good times, when things are going really well, they are the people who organize the local you know, bridge leak, right? They're the people who mow the lawn for the whole community. They are great people to have around. But when they're activated by threat, they want things to stay the same. They want everybody to think alike. They want, they want that, that grip on things. And that, I think, explains some of that, that feeling, is that those people do feel very threatened. And what they want is for everybody to think the same and be the same. And so it's not enough to say, I personally am pro-life, but if you have another theory, that that's like, no, we all have to think the same. And in that mindset, every, sin, every single person who doesn't, you know, fundamentally a liberal mindset, right? Yeah. Other people can't think different things. We all have to be the same. And I think that is some of what has infected that conservative movement, is the feeling that if there's any one woman who can still get an abortion, then it's all pointless. And that is a recipe for feeling like you never, ever win, because you never will control every single other person outside of you know, North Korea, and probably not even then. <laughs> so that would, be, that would be my thesis. But it is really bizarre. Like, it's very bizarre to come from a country, Britain, that has had a conservative government since 2010, had Brexit, people voted for it, it has happened, and still you will get this sense of, like, where's my country? I've lost my country. And that is something that I think is, is ultimately part of the future of conservatism, is answering that question for yeah. people, trying to give people a positive story about what your country can be in a conservative way that isn't about a sense of, of loss. Thank you. To add one thought, was, when we're talking about the life cycle and the mass of six, I'm over 60 myself, so I, I'm speaking about my own group, that there comes a certain point in your life where for you, the future holds decline leading to extinction. Um, and, <laughs> and, and it's very natural to project that onto the surrounding world. And it's, it's actually, it's, it's weirdly comforting because who wants to think that things are going to get really good after you've left the scene? <laughs> well, I can't imagine things getting any better after we leave the scene. Thank you both so much. <laughs> Please welcome back, Evan Smith. All right, again, a big hand, please, for uh, David Crum, Helen Lewis, and Becca Rosen. Great conversation. Thanks so much for joining us this afternoon. I want to encourage you to go back to the ideas stage for great conversations that starting, started about a half hour ago, but really we're going to kick into high gear now, so you'll have time to get back over and be part of those. If you are 21 and older... We invite you to join us for a happy hour on the District Pier at 5 p.m. Be sure to check out the Atlantic Festival site, atlanticfestival.com, or my agendas, the My Agenda page for the full schedule. And if you are interested in exploring more of the Atlantic, we ask you to support the Atlantic's amazing public service journalism by becoming a subscriber. Never a more important time than now. Visit theatlantic.com for subscription options, and if you're already a subscriber, thank you very much. Enjoy the afternoon. We'll see you again. Thank you.